Corner store philosophy, wine prophets who probably felt the greatest hide and chase that dragon into poverty, inherited a lower self-esteem and a lack of knowledge, got they refund checks and turn it back to college. Who needs a degree to survive in these streets? Weather 400 degrees, juveniles chasing dreams, hustling harder for smaller returns. They call it life shit. We live and we learn. What's up, world? It's JP1, a.k.a. Jackpot the Chosen One, representing Detroit to the fullest. Right now, you politicking with Poe on Poe Politicking. Let's get it. PoePolitikin.com. Welcome back to Poe Politicking. I'm now politicking with Sherazad Morgan. She's the author of The Fuck List, a sex memoir. How you doing today? Good morning. Thank you. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you for coming on. So the first thing, I just want you to talk about your background a little bit. Let the people know a little bit about you. Well, let's see. I'm 54 years old. I'm a mother of three children. I was married 25 years to a great man, and I have been totally single the past three years, not even a hint of a boyfriend. I am from Germany. I moved to the U. I moved to Nebraska when I was nine years old. So I speak German, Farsi, and English. I have a um, bachelor's in computer science and an MBA, and I've been practicing transcendental meditation since I'm 12. And that's like, I love that more than I love sex. Yeah, I'm saying can't, so. Can, the first thing, <laughs> even before we, I mean, uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but even before we start talking about the book and everything, I want you to talk about that meditation because I, I like that too. So can you talk about that a little bit with the listeners? Yeah, well, Transcendental Meditation um, is, my mother is a GM teacher, and um, she taught me to meditate when I was 12, so I like to do it because it gives me, like, this really deep, silent place I can go into in myself, and it makes me feel happy, and I notice when I am meditating regularly, twice a day, my life goes really good, I feel happy, and I glow, and... I feel kind of aligned with the universe, if that makes sense. And things go my way and my life really flows. And then when I stop doing it after a few days, I feel kind of like very ordinary. I guess it's kind of like working out. You have to keep doing it. So, um, it's, I've taken many meditation courses, and I, I wanted to be a TM teacher myself. So I took the first half of the six-month training when I was 14. Like it was, I was super into it. Now it's just something that I do at home by myself. Then what kind of teacher are you saying? Uh, um, transcendental meditation. Oh, I thought you so that, at first. I thought you were saying gym teacher. That's what I was like. Uh, you saying? Oh uh, no. So like, if people are interested in it, like it was first popularized in the '60s when the Beatles started meditating. Like Oprah and her whole staff just started like a year or two ago. She did a whole show on it. Her, um, Dr. Oz meditates, Russell Brand, and they do it, a lot of um, PT, right now they're doing, um, introducing TM to um, veterans with PTSD, and I've done a lot of studies on that, and also there's a foundation that te- and puts in money to teach it to school children in public schools, like in San Francisco, and they've seen their um, absenteeism go way down, and um, the children are happier, and not fighting as much so i want to give a big plug to tm i think tm helps me get more horny too because it puts me more in my center and makes me feel relaxed and when people are stressed out they don't want to have sex right the last thing you want to do so people want to have sex more when they're like feeling good about themselves and feeling healthy and fit yeah i say i know uh it's good for your sex drive yeah i say i know uh like hip-hop wise i know (laughs) i gotta bring sex into every conversation sorry yeah, I was saying I know uh, Russell Simmons. Um, he's real big into meditation too, but hip hop wise. But I was gonna ask you. So just to clarify, so meditation is like let's say you're praying. When it's praying, it's more outward. So meditation is just more inward, right? Um. Yes. Well, prayer can be inward too. If you think that God is a being in the sky, it would be outward. And if you feel like God is within you, then it would be inward, I guess. Um, with meditation, I, with the TM practice, I have a mantra that I say to myself, and it's I don't focus on it. So the way that we're instructed is when we start thinking of something else, it's okay. You don't have to focus on the mantra. So it's very effortless. And so when we notice 
we have other thoughts coming in, it's okay. Then we just easily go back to the mantra. And so it's like very effortless, and that's why I like doing it. Okay. <laughs> Easy. And then also, I, so I want to ask you about something too, because it kind of stuck out to me when you first introduced yourself. So you were saying you was married 25 years and you got a divorce. So, you know, that's a long time. So why did you end up getting a divorce? Um, you know, after the kids were grown up, I wanted to, um, I noticed my husband again. <laughs> And I want, and, and in my late 40s, I started getting horny again. Like, we had separate bedrooms most of our marriage. I got really interested in him again, and it was also right after I quit um, my 10-year Vicodin addiction. So I really woke up to life. The kids were older, and I really tried to reconnect with him, and I wanted it to have sex with him, more sex with him, more connected sex, more intimacy. And he didn't want that, even though he really loved me. Um, I think I'm just going to speak on his behalf. He, he wasn't, well, he wasn't interested in it, and I think he was afraid of it, right? Like, the intimacy I wanted was just, like, pushing on his edges outside of his comfort zone. And I got tired of him telling me no to sex and no to kissing and no to just being close. And one day, you know, you know how when someone's always pushing you away, one day you stop wanting them, and that's what happened. So I just, one day I didn't want him anymore. It was just like, I just didn't want him anymore. So I moved into the guest room and two months later I moved into my apartment. Mm -hmm. And, and then he's remarried now, so it's all good. Yeah, then I'm not trying to, uh, you don't have to answer if you want to, but I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just trying to dig deeper into the interview. So I just want to ask you about the addiction. Like, where did that come from? Like, why do you think you was addicted to Vicodin? Well, um, I welcome all of your questions because I want to share my story, like, and I am not afraid of any of your questions, so you can ask me whatever you want. All right. And, yeah, and so that, I was, um, I started doing that when we moved to San Diego. I guess the kids were all in school and I was home alone all day and I was lonely and I remembered an article I'd read in the Wall Street Journal earlier like a year earlier about buying hydrocodone online. And at the time I read it, I thought, I can't start an addiction, I have kids to raise. But there in San Diego, all alone all day, I, I was lonely and I wanted something and I didn't have, I didn't have my emotional needs met, okay? I didn't have a close relationship with my husband. I didn't go looking for friends. So I just turned to those pills, like Mother's Little Helper, and I just gave myself permission to feel good through those pills. And then I needed more and more and more of them because, you know, I developed a tolerance. And by the end, I was taking Norcos. So one Norco would be like two Vicodin. So by the end, I was taking like 30 to 40 Norcos a day. Mm. And I was getting them all from the doctor. So I was like had lists of which pharmacy and which doctor so they wouldn't find out about each other and it was a way for me to get my emotional needs met really like they were my lover and my best friend those pills and what they did to me is they numbed my body and they numbed my heart yeah because you were saying like they let me still function sorry yeah cause i'm saying because you was really you want you was on that love and affection so it was numbing you not getting that yes okay so i was still like giving affection to my children you know like i was very physical with my children i hugged them all the time i and i i didn't have that with my husband my yeah, husband see, never hugged once but i said you need I'm that so, from a you need that I, from a yeah. man still that's the thing too No, I was just saying you need that from a man still because you were saying you had it from the kids, but I said you still was missing the man's touch. Yes, but the interesting thing was during that time I didn't want his touch because we were not really close. We were like um, a teen raising our children, and I wasn't looking for it from him at the time. Hmm. I had stopped looking for that from him. I had stopped years earlier wanting that from him. I wasn't going to cheat on him, and I didn't know where to get it, right? Mm -hmm. So I was no longer trying to get that from him. He was the dad. He was 
you know, the guy who loved me, but he wasn't like a man I wanted to be close to. All right. So why did you decide to write the F list? The F, no, it's not the F list, it's fuck list. <laughs> so why did you decide to write the fuck list? Yeah. Well, you know, um, my friend, I, I'm pretty open, so on my Facebook, after I left my husband, I kept saying, oh, you know, woke up with the beautiful woman in my bed, or, oh, I got fucked in the ass last night, I feel so good. I was just saying stuff, you know, that excited me about what I was doing, and people weren't used to hearing a woman speak like this, you know? And so my friends kept saying, you should write a book. And I'm like, no, I don't want to write a book. I had a job. I had a job. I was consulting on facilities for school districts. And I'm like, I don't want to write a book. I never had an, an idea to do that. But then two years ago, I was so sad over this guy. It was a hookup. I got attached to a lot of the guys I hooked up with. And I was super sad over this guy. And I started looking for some meaning and purpose to my life. My job was boring. My kids were gone. I'm single and all alone. I'm crying over this guy. You know, like, what is this my life for? And um, I think a lot of people ask themselves this question, you know, after a breakup or when your kids move out. Like, why am I here? Like, what do I want to create with my life? How am I going to get some joy out of my life? I was looking for a purpose, and I spent like three months just like asking myself and just wondering like, what am I here for? And right around that time when another one of my friends said, you should write a book, and I'm like, that's it. That's it. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And I got, and then this other friend said, oh, yeah, you have a fuck list? That's the name of your book, The Fuck List. And then it was on. I was so excited. I pictured myself on the Oprah show talking about the fuck list and the women owning their sexual power and women being allowed to claim their sexual lust without shame. And I was just going to be a champion to promote sexual freedom in this country. And I just started writing and writing. And I wrote for nine months. And then it was done. All right. And I noticed, because I follow you on social media, you get a lot of negative feedback as well. So how do you feel about that? I, I noticed a lot of, it seemed like a lot of guys, like they always send some crazy shit to you. So, and I saw you disabled your comments on YouTube too. So how do you feel about the comments sometimes you get? You know, I get only positive comments. The only negative comments I get are some of the guys on my YouTube channel. And they're like, um, I don't even know who they are. So the people that are on my face, like on my Facebook, my Instagram, my LinkedIn, um, I get, and my my author website, when people will actually take the time to email me, I get so much fan mail from women, from men, all over the world. Like I probably get like three or four things a day, plus whatever's on my Facebook that I haven't even seen because they're not my friend. And, like, they go into detail how I've inspired them, how I've helped them, how they love my book. And sometimes they'll email me multiple times. And so the negative comments to me are just, um, I can't take them seriously because they don't reflect really. Oh, and then the men, I, the people I meet in real life are so supportive. Like, the men I meet, the men I hook up with, like, they all love me. And I see how I inspire people. So, so like, the negative comments are, like, 1% of all that's coming into me, right? So, so they don't affect how I view myself. The only thing I don't like about them is I feel like my YouTube channel is reflecting my work, and I don't want it to be, like, I don't want it to become a place where people trash talk and downgrade what I'm trying to do because they think... I don't want it to turn into, like, the such pool of negative comments. But the comments that people make reflect who they are. It doesn't reflect who I am. Mm. I just want to keep it, like, I want to keep a positive vibe around my work, you know? So that's really important to keep because I want to inspire people. So I want to keep the mood upbeat. Um, the trash talking is probably guys who have a story about, women who enjoy sex because they've been hurt by women who've enjoyed sex. They've been cheated on. Maybe their mom ignored them because she was out, you know, putting men ahead of their ch her children. And so I think it comes out of their pain. So try to be 
you know, understanding of their pain when they're saying something negative about me. Mm. That's deep right there. <laughs> I was gonna say so. <laughs> oh, so what are your your I guess your top two goals for your career are right now at this stage? I'm I'm writing on my second book called Permission, and when that's done, I want to um, see what comes next. I'm also considering making some videos that I would charge for, like, you know, how to make love to a man, how to make love to a woman, how to reignite your passion, um, sexual taboos. I don't know yet exactly how it's going to look. I would love to um, make some money off my videos and off my writing. All right. And what are some, I guess, your top two relationship tips? First is love yourself. Um, Love yourself first so that you can show up being really present with other people, right? So you can manage your own emotions and be secure in yourself. And the second one would be to, um, I guess, out of that, to love and honor other people. I think a relationship is all about love. So loving yourself and then being free and sharing that love with other people. And I guess the third one would be allow yourself to receive the love that other people want to give you and don't block that. Like for myself, I've been blocking a lot of love. Like I have so much fan mail. I was like hating on my fans. Like, why are you guys emailing me? Why are you guys texting me? And my son's like, Mom, you can't hate on your fans. And I was just getting mad on my fans because they didn't look like the kinds of guys I was trying to get for a relationship, right? But it doesn't matter. Like, I wasn't being loving. So a relationship is any person that you encounter is to just love them and honor them. That's like a spiritual practice, even if you don't want to. All right. Then I want some sex tips. Like, if somebody want to get okay. better in, in the bedroom. <laughs> Well, then you gotta say sex tips. You no, 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 no. I want I, see. It, it was a two part question. So the first one was relationship. Okay. Now I want the sex. See, I, I eat, that's foreplay. I eased it into it. So you know, yeah. <laughs> I was surprised you didn't start the interview with sex tips. <laughs> oh no, no, no. I gotta eat foreplay. Foreplay. You know, we gotta ease it into. You know. Okay. Well, on the sex tips, I think just from having talked to a lot of men. I know what, I hope that there are women listening to this. The number one thing is for women to own their sexual lust and to enjoy themselves in the bedroom, to mm. love their bodies and to love their pleasure. There's nothing worse than a woman who can't enjoy the man she's with because she's worried about, you know, a freckle on her butt or a roll on her thigh. So, so to just allow yourself to just get lost and the pleasure and to you know I think good sex isn't about a technique like lick the dildo lick the cock the swear that way that's maybe the next question good sex is about your attitude it's about how you feel about sex your beliefs about sex your beliefs about pleasure that's the core of it who you are on the inside okay so and also how fit you are. Like, guys who are really heavy will just lay there in bed. They can't watch me giving them a blowjob because their stomach is covering up the view. So guys who are really lean can move better in bed. They can engage more. They can move better, right? So who you are, how fit you are, how, how you feel about yourself, how, you know, if you're stressed out or tired, it's not good. So love yourself. Claim your sexual power and lust and desire and know that's hot. And know that the more you claim it, you're going to just turn your partner on. Do it for your pleasure and your partner's pleasure. And be healthy and fit and have fun. So your attitude, that's the number one sex tip. And then what do you, just, uh, just a little briefly, just talk about what you mean by healthy and fit. Um... You know, like, I think that people who, um, 
The other day I had a hookup with a, a guy in his early 40s who's like super lean and fit. And it was amazing sex for me. I don't usually see guys like this very often. He like, he does a lot of triathlons and he does yoga and he surfs and he had like a really, he was tall and lean, had like a really fit body. So for example, the average guy, when he goes down on me, like he wants me to lay down and he'll just like get between my legs. And it's kind of boring for me. Um, I like it more when a guy is confident, just bends me over the bed and goes down on me or bends me over. But this particular guy, because he's so used to being in his body and moving, you know, like he had me sideways on the bed and he spread my legs apart and then he just bent over so like he was sideways to me and he had one hand on my foot. Like I've never had a guy position me like that. You know, and like, it's just the way that they move. I've had other really lean guys, like they move around a lot in the bed. You know, like they're comfortable, when you're comfortable moving your body, because you're moving your body anyway, you can, you move your body a lot different in the bedroom. Yeah. So like heavy guys will just lay there. Hey. As, as, there's not a lot of movement. And hey. I, like a, I like a guy who's limber, who can really move. Hey. Like, I like the energy that a guy brings. The energy a guy brings I is just huge turn on. I like it. Do you want to know what else I like? Because I'm getting carried away now. I don't want to. <laughs> no, nah, I, I was gonna say. I was gonna say. Time out, right quick though, because because I'm a heavier guy, but I go hard in the paint, so I don't know. <laughs> so I was gonna say. Uh, I, I was gonna say no, you can't. I hey, hey. I, like. <laughs> I was gonna say. Hey, that don't that don't apply to every big guy. So hey, oh hey, shit. <laughs> and also, when their stomachs are really big, like if I'm riding a guy. Um, I like to like, I like to lay on top of the guy, you know, and have him deep inside me. And when there's a stomach in the way, I can't lay flat on him because the stomach's in the way, so I can't get all of his cock inside of me. Nah. Um, that just depends on how big that, like, the cock lean is, guys though. Get harder, like lean guys get super, super hard, and I like a hard cock, and it has to do with the blood flow. So I like sex with lean guys better, but that's just me. But there are exceptions to the rules. Yeah, there's always exceptions to the rules, so, you know. What's that? I said there. there's always exceptions to the rules. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Of course. I'm sure you're all awesome in bed. Yeah. I, I'm just saying, like, what I personally have seen, and I mean, I'm generalizing. Yeah. And um, I like it when, um, I like it when men grab me really tight and squeeze me and grab me that's what arouses me and turns me on and you, it's really cute because you talking about like choke you okay. choke your neck you talking about like choking you that's what you talking about um i like to be held down without pain i like to i like it when a man holds me tight puts his arms around me holds me tight grabs my ass puts his hand around my neck on the back you know it just like handles me and holds me tight i like it when i'm uh, like when we're having intercourse, I'm on my stomach and he's laying on top of me, you know, and I'm totally engulfed by his body. It's like so nice. He's breathing in my ear and I'm totally engulfed by his strength. Okay, so I, I hear what you're oh, saying. I'm getting turned on now, huh? No, uh, I, so I hear what you're saying and you're saying you like this and you like this. But what if you were a guy and he say, shit, I like doing what I like doing and I'm just going to do what I do. So, you know, <laughs> you know. They never do, but they never do because the man, well, I've only, I my experience with men is limited to hookups, okay? Because I just hook up with guys. I've never had sex with one man more than three times. Mostly it's just one time. So I don't know what it would be like in a relationship or with someone who's a regular hookup buddy or someone I have feelings for. I'm talking about just the first hookup sex. So my repertoire is really limited. And the men always get turned on when I get turned on. Like, when I get really turned on, sometimes they'll just come, like, unexpectedly. They always tell me I get turned on when the woman is turned on. And I'll tell them how I want the penetration. Like, I'll be like, go deep and just stay deep and barely move. Just, like, move a fraction of a millimeter. Just give me that deep pressure. And they'll do it, and they love it. Or I'll, whatever I tell them I like, they always like it. So I, I think that for men, maybe, like, they like a lot more things. Because women seem to have, like, we all seem to like different things, right? Like, some women like their ass bank. I hate that. Yeah, I was going to say, so I know with, like with me personally. that angle. Yeah, I'm going to say, like, with me personally, I know, like, with me, when, like, I'm doing what I do, 
And I like this. It's to me, if like you give me directions, it turns me off. Like, so how do you feel about that? I know, like, you know what I'm saying? When they say do this, do this, do this, that throws me off. Like, I just like to, to be in the moment and do my thing. Like, I don't really, you know, we just need to be doing what we do. I don't like, you know. So how do you feel about that? Mm. Well, I don't know. I do know sometimes when I'm first with a guy and I tell him what I don't. If he's doing something that doesn't feel good, I'm going to tell him that. I need to tell him that. It doesn't feel good. But you know what I'm saying? It don't feel good and to you. But it might feel... That, it I know might they feel... don't like it and their cocks go limp. That's okay. We can get it back. Because it's not okay. I don't... I used to... I used to let guys do what they do that I didn't enjoy because I thought I should... When I was younger, I was afraid to speak up. Uh, I was afraid to say it because, and then later I was like, I have to have sex the way the man likes it to please him. Yeah, that's if a, I don't want like it. I was just about it really dried out. And then also, I would think, um, well, maybe I will. Maybe other women must like this, so I should like this. Or I would think, well, maybe I will get to like this if I just endure the, the unpleasantries of this and the pain of this. <laughs> maybe I will eventually like it. I don't do that anymore. I don't let the man make. I don't let the man be the authority over my sexual pleasure. So if I don't like something, I'm going to tell him. And if he loses the direction, that's okay. We can get it back. And if he likes doing stuff that I don't like, like I had a hookup buddy that loves me to choke on his cock. It turns him on. Like he can't come any other way. But I don't like that. There's some girls who will. So I don't hook up with him anymore because our sexual styles are just too different. Yeah. Oh, but that's... If I'm in a good role with someone and we're just moving and grouping, there is no need to talk. So I can totally see how it would turn you off. But then again, I don't think a woman should have to have sex that she doesn't enjoy either. And you have to say things in a way to not make the man feel diminished. It's just like, I don't like this. It's not like you're bad for doing this. Because another woman is going to like it. Yeah, so you, you kind of answered my question because I was going to say, well, if, you just, if I got some shit you, you just don't like, then we just should be separate. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, exactly right. Because, you know, like, I'm very vanilla in the bedroom. I don't like kink. I don't like BDSM. I don't use toys. I don't like threesomes. I don't like polyamory or swinging, you know. And people are into that. They're not going to like fucking me or being my boyfriend. So they should find somebody else that they're more matched with, you know. I don't like really rough sex or objective play sex. I don't like it. Like, there's some girls who just want to start out in doggy style, and that's all they want. I like it to be a lot more intimate and connected. Um, so, so, to me... I always like to start with sex. If a guy fucks me good in the bedroom and the energy's good, then I'm like, the sex was good. Maybe I want to date this guy. <laughs> yeah. The sexual styles are so different what people like. All right. And what would you like to say to, like, um, any other, somebody listening to the show, they want to aspire, they want to do exactly what you're doing right now, what would you say to them? Well, you have to give yourself permission to live the life that you want. And and once you do that, I think that you'll be you can be really happy and discover a whole new life that maybe maybe that people I think a lot of people live a life based on how they should and they haven't discovered who they really are because they're trying to fit into some expectations they have of themselves or pleasing society or other people. I also want to say that I was taught that men would never respect me or like me if I was a slut. I guess you could consider me promiscuous or a slut. My real life experience is that men really, really like me, and I want all women to know this, that men really respect a woman who has sex and owns her sexual power out of her pleasure. Not to get approval, not to get attention, you know, not because she's drunk and looking for something to fill her time. But a woman who wants sexual pleasure and goes after it is hot, and men like that. So give yourself permission to go after it. That's all. 
right. What would you like to say to your fans, people have been supporting you so far? Oh, my gosh. I just want to say thank you very much to everybody who sends me emails and nice comments because that, you know, that makes me feel loved and it makes me want to keep doing what I'm doing. It makes me feel like what I'm, like, it gives me, it helps me get rid of the shame that I have still about what I do. I have some of it too, so all the fan mail is letting me know that I'm doing something good and not something bad. And then any new listeners that are just not listening to you, let them know why should they follow you on your journey right now. Um, well, I don't know if they should, but they can <laughs> check me out and see if there's something there that could inspire them. I think that, um, well, what I do that's different is I share my, my story and my feelings and my weaknesses, honestly, and I think that we can all discover ourselves more and learn about ourselves when we share each other, when we share each other's stories. So, so yeah, just check me out, and I have my um, YouTube channel, Charlotte Morgan, and my book, um... I don't know. I don't know how to prom- talk people into checking it out. I guess if you're <laughs> interested in sex, you may just want to check it out anyway. Uh, and also, guys want to check out my nudes on my um, webpage, fuckless.com. I have a nudes gallery on there with my pussy shots and stuff. Basically done. Yeah. I want to say thank you for coming through politics with me. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. I want appreciate to, it. I want to give you a uh, open mic. So, was there any question that I didn't ask you that you want to ask yourself and answer? Um, no, I covered the main ones. Thank you for asking. I want women to own their sexual pleasure and not be ashamed of it. We're listening to popolitikin.com. We got you stuck. Got you stuck off the realness. Hi, this is Charlotte Morgan. I'm politicking with Poe on Poe Politicking. Check out my book at www.f-cklist.com. Bucklist.com. Since 2008, there has been one website, www.popoliticking.com, on top of the music business, behind the scenes, and on the front line. Chris Porter, a.k.a. Paul Politicking. Mr. Porter has worked with everybody, Universal Motown Records, Young Money, Rockefeller Records, and more. Paul Politicking is a conscious brand that aligns with artists, businesses, and brands to get more exposure. What are you waiting for? It's time to open your mind to the other side of the music business. Log on to www.popolitikin.com That's www.popolitikin.com Call 760-717-5803 for your interview. That number again is 760-717-5803.